sorry, I have to record, I almost forgot. <laughs> All right, so Robin Sanderson is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the physics and astronomy department. And she also holds a joint research uh, staff position at the Center for Computational Astrophysics in New York. She received her PhD from MIT in 2011, after which she was a postdoc at the Captain Institute at the University of, I think, Groningen in the Netherlands. And uh, then she was a NSF AAPF fellow at Columbia, NYU, and then ultimately Caltech, which is where I met Robin when I was a graduate student. So her research focuses on using galactic dynamics to study the dark matter distribution of galaxies with the focus on connecting Milky Way observations from Gaia um, and large spectroscopic surveys to cosmological hydrodynamics simulations. So today Robin will be discussing how combining this new data with these sophisticated models of galaxy formation improves our understanding of the dark matter distribution of the Milky Way and the local group in particular. So please take it away, Robin. Thank you, Ivana. All right, um, here we go. So I know it's awkward to ask questions during colloquia on Zoom. So I'm gonna try to pause after each sort of third of this talk. Um, but Ivana, if you see any clarifying questions come up, just flag me and I'll stop. Will do. All right. So today I'm gonna talk about what we can learn about dark matter from the Milky Way through galaxy dynamics. Um, and the situation that we're in today really uh, is, is a renaissance in this field uh, because of the Gaia mission, which I don't think I really have to describe to this audience. Um, Gaia has been conducting for some years now an astrometric survey of the galaxy. It is observed uh, over a billion stars, um, all of which went into making the map that you see here. Uh, and it's about to release its uh, third data release sometime in the next year or two, depending on pandemic things, um, but has been upgrading its ability to measure the proper motions and parallaxes to stars um, in a volume and with a precision that's a thousand times better, literally, than the data set that we had before. And that's really uh, sparked a revolution in our understanding of the dynamical state or states of our galaxy. Um, and Gaia is really only the beginning of this new window that we're opening on our, on our Milky Way and on the, the characteristics of its stars. Um, LSST, Euclid, many sort of four meter spectroscopic surveys and uh, eventually some new large telescopes with spectrographs on them are all looking to get underway with a slightly delayed timeline compared to this thing that I'm showing you here. Um, again, thanks to the pandemic, but uh, many of these will in the foreground of what they might be targeting uh, for their main programs be capturing the uh, phase-based distribution of Milky Way stars, uh, and also um, information about their chemical compositions. So I think it's not crazy that in another nine years, we're going to have uh, six-dimensional phase-based information plus uh, abundances for stars all the way to the Milky Way's virial radius and probably beyond. Um, and uh, as we improve our uh, space-based capabilities with the Roman Space Telescope, which isn't even on this timeline, um, we'll be able to make resolved stellar maps, not just to, of Andromeda, the beautiful work that's been done there, um, but similar maps for up to 100 nearby Milky Way-like galaxies. And so we're really transitioning from uh, a detailed information in, in phase space only from a handful of stars near the sun uh, to a full galaxy view over the next decade. And we're gonna be able to connect it using resolved stellar maps uh, to the population of galaxies of which the Milky Way is a member. So I just wanna show you what that looks like in a few different stellar tracers in terms of volumes. Um, so LSST, I've superimposed these here on a, a, an image generated from one of our, our cosmological simulations of a pair of galaxies like the Milky Way and Andromeda. And in this image, they're separated by about the physical distance that that pair is in our 
galaxy, but of course we don't have this outer view. Um, and so these circles sort of show how far you can see different tracer stars uh, using different instruments. So LSST will be able to see RGB stars all through the entire uh, local group. Um, and we'll see main sequence stars uh, out to the edges of the, of the Milky Way's virial radius. Um, a lot of missions are going to get various qualities of astrometry over the next decade or so. Um, if you focus on the dashed lines in the center of this, those are sort of the distance to which Gaia measures proper motions for uh, RGB stars here. Can you see my pointer? Yes, I can see it. Okay, good. So RGB, R Lyrae, and main sequence turnoff. Um, LSST is going to get pretty high quality proper motions um, based on some work that's been done with, um, with current surveys to optimize the ability to do ground-based astrometry. Um, and we'll see R Lyrae way out here um, and RGB stars even further. Uh, with usable proper motion data. And finally, uh, the now Roman satellite, um, when it launches, we'll be doing a, a survey of a big chunk of the sky for, for weak lensing purposes, but in the foregrounds, we'll be able to pick up uh, proper motions of, of Milky Way stars out to very large distances. And finally, uh, in, in terms of spectroscopy, the, the missing components that aren't uh, established either by photometry or um, astrometry, the missing components in this picture um, are also going to extend to much larger distances at, as the decade goes on. Um, and so this picture is going to get a lot more complete and more connected um, in its cosmological context than we've been able to, to see before. Um, so the reason I care about this is that the Milky Way stars are our best tracer of its dark matter distribution and of the history of our galaxy, which is equally sensitive to the type of dark matter that we have in the universe, or at least in our galaxy. Um, and so here's a, a snapshot from one of the simulations that I work with from the FIRE2 collaboration. So this is a, a Milky Way mass system uh, that was formed from cosmological initial conditions and run to the present day. And here on, in blue, you see the dark matter, uh, which in this particular run is a cold dark matter model. And in yellow here, you see the density of stars in the same simulation. So you notice that it's a biased tracer of the dark matter, but that some stars are definitely more useful than others. So in the center of this, uh, you see the disk here. Um, but at larger distances where it's mostly dark matter, if you compare the two, um, you see individual sort of point-like tracers uh, in the bound satellite galaxies you see here. Um, and then also uh, tidal streams uh, that are unique and extremely useful at probing these outskirts. Uh, since they're stars, we can associate all with the same progenitor galaxy or globular cluster. Um, and we therefore know that they must, have, must be on similar orbits to one another to start off with. Um, and so, So to give you a little bit more background about how you get from this to this, um, it's basically at the lowest level, a big initial value problem. So you pick your uh, initial conditions, which Planck has and other such missions have kindly measured for us. Um, you pick your dark matter model that sets about how much dark matter you have and any interactions that it has in the in the late times. Um, so in cold dark matter, the cross section of interactions between dark matter particles just sets the amount um, and then is ignored in the late universe because those interactions are uh, not very common. Uh, but in other models, that's not necessarily the case. Then you pick some region of this uh, map and populate it with your n-body particles. You add gravity and time, and you get a prediction for what the dark matter distribution should look like. Um, so I didn't include in here anything about the stars or gas content, um, because the simplest version of this problem is just to simulate the dark matter itself as collisionless uh, particles. And this view of the Aquarius simulation, which just did that for a Milky Way mass galaxy, 
sort of summarizes a bunch of the different predictions that this type of work can make. So um, you can see here that it predicts that the main halo, which is this large thing, is triaxial, um, not completely spherically symmetric. It has a very dense core. And then you see lots of other little blobs um, that are sort of self-similar copies of this at smaller mass scales um, with a dense center um, outskirts that fall away. And the structures that you see here come on many, many different mass scales and size scales. Um, and so those, those generic predictions are, are what we start with when we try to compare uh, with what we observe in the Milky Way. Um, but some of the observations that we make when we try to make that comparison can have multiple explanations uh, that impinge upon our ability to determine properties of the dark matter. So an example is the so-called missing satellites problem, which now most people would agree has been sorted, but um, it's a nice illustration of why this is a difficult uh, question to answer. So we see far fewer actual satellite galaxies in the Milky Way than you can see little blobs of dark matter in this image from the simulation. So this, these lines on the, on the top here are the prediction of how many subhalos you know, little substructures in the Milky Way's main dark matter halo you expect to have as a function sort of a square root of their masses. Um, and since we don't see all of these lit up with stars, you can, you can change the dark matter model uh, by adding some primordial temperature to it. And that cuts off a lot of the structures at small masses and starts to reconcile with the number of things we actually see. Alternatively, you can add, uh, stars and gas to your simulation, and then a combination of reionization energy and uh, feedback from star formation can give you the same overall effect uh, in the sense that now you still have all those halos, it's just that most of them don't light up with stars because they don't form enough stars either because they're so small they can't hold onto their gas during reionization or because stellar feedback cuts it off later on. And then you end up with the same, with, with a commensurate prediction for how many satellite galaxies you have. So the reason I bring this up uh, is to illustrate how the process of galaxy formation is linking the dark and the standard model sectors here through gravity, at least, if not more, depending on your dark matter model. And so one of the big questions in this field is how we disentangle new physics from stuff that we should understand, like galaxy formation, but in many cases is still a, a work in progress. Um, and both of these sides of this coin are interesting. Um, and so it's useful to try to construct tests that are um, isolating one from the other in whatever ways that we can. Um, all of the stars that you see are relatively sparse compared to the dark matter. So the dark matter is driving the dynamics rather than in the center of the galaxy where it's competing with the process of galaxy formation on it on a regular basis. Um, but you can also see other predictions like the number of satellites, the rate at which they merge in, um, the way in which they tidally disrupt to form tidal streams. All of those things also depend on the model of dark matter uh, because it shapes the whole process of uh, hierarchical formation at every mass scale. Um, and so there's not just one prediction of dark matter that you're going for here. It's not just the mass profile and the shape of the main halo, but also the population of galaxies around it um, and the, the way in which and the number of tidal streams that are formed. Um, and then what happens to those tidal streams and their interactions with whatever substructure the dark matter is making. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, three of these things today. Um, the total mass, the shape, and the lumpiness, so to speak, of the dark matter halo. So let's let's deal with the mass first, because this is the zero Thor thing. That really, this is the galaxy we live in. We should get this right. Um, and it's especially important because when you talk about uh, the structures at smaller scales and what those predictions are in different dark matter models, um, in nearly every case, they're normalized by the total mass of the main halo, the one that the Milky Way galaxy lives in. Um, so here's an example of the number of substructures you'd expect at a given mass scale uh, for different mass uh, main halos. 
Um, and you can see that the difference in the number of subhalos you get is just a linear function of the mass. So if you have a 10 to the 12 solar mass mean halo, you get, and then you increase the mass by a factor of 10, you get 10 times more substructures. Um, so we have to know the Milky Way's total mass in order to know what simulations and what predictions to compare it with in the first place. And because of Gaia, which has extremely good data in the inner 20 kiloparsecs of our galaxy, we now know and agree on what the mass and shape are pretty well within that region. But if you go back to this example, that's like here. So we have a long way to go before we get out of the region where the process of galaxy formation is significantly shaping what's happening in the dark matter because they're uh, similar mass in stars as dark matter, uh, and therefore they are sort of on equal footing as far as gravity is concerned. But then further out, you have these nice tidal streams that exist in a place where most of the mass is dark matter, and so you don't have as much of a problem disentangling these two types of processes. Um, and in, but in this region, Gaia hasn't made much headway because it just doesn't have a lot of data. So if you look down here, these are two mass profiles uh, derived from different um, sets of data involving Gaia. And here's all the different people that have tried to do this measurement before and after Gaia. And the effect of Gaia has been this sort of agreement down here between all of these different bars here. And so that's the region where Gaia has data right now. But once you get out here, you see that there's like a factor of three difference between all these different estimates. Part of the reason for that is that most of them are either uh, analyses of point tracers treating globular clusters or systems of satellite galaxies as one big genes model, um, or they fits to single tidal streams. And both of those sets are uh, subject to a lot of model degeneracies. In this case of tidal streams, because you're only seeing stars on one family of orbits through the potential. And in the case of uh, point tracers, because it's unclear how well you can, the assumptions for genes modeling are suited to the actual dynamical state of those systems. Um, so we can do a lot better now with Gaia because we have um, much more phase space information about many more tracers. So this is what we were able to do with just the point tracers with Gaia. But um, with this six dimensional data, you can also revolutionize the study of tidal streams. So you can use theorist coordinates instead of observers coordinates for one, which is where I came into this game. So ordinarily, you observe the positions and velocities of stars in a tidal stream, and you see that they wind through the galaxy over time. Um, but if you know the potential of your galaxy and you convert those into actions and angles using this sort of relationship here for the actions, um, where P is essentially the star's velocities and Q are their positions, um, this canonical transformation gives you a new view that is much more useful. Uh, from a modeling standpoint. So in this little movie, you're seeing the formation of a, of a couple of tidal streams in different colors over here in position space. In this panel, you see them in one of the actions versus its conjugate angle. And down here, you see two of the three actions. And you can immediately see that this is a nice simple space to, to work in because each complicated mess over here is a nice tight little blob here because the actions are adiabatically invariant. So even if the galaxy is just steadily growing, they'll continue to be in this nice little cluster There's no as long as there's no major merger. So this is a nice space, but in order to do this transformation, you need to know the potential, which is the thing that we were trying to measure. Um, if you did know it, you could take all your streams that you see in the sky and then transform them into action space and see a lot of little blobs. Since we don't know, however, we can use the fact that we think the stars in the outskirts of the galaxy should have this form in action space in order to determine what the correct potential is. So for instance, in this toy model, here's one of the actions just to illustrate how the dependencies work. So the parameters of this model potential are its mass and its scale radius, m and b. And then you observe the positions and velocity of a bunch of stars. You use those to compute the angular momenta and the energies along with the potential model. And then you can get the, this action and then this uh, another action in the system, which is very symmetric, is the, the z component of the angular momentum. So that's plotted here. 
And so if you guess something close to the right mass, you'll get these little blobs. But if you just scroll through, you'll be able to see when that happens. Um, wait for it. There's the right one. Right? So you only get that clustering uh, in your stellar halo from all the different tidal streams that built it up if you're close to the right potential model. And so you can quantify the amount of clustering in this space and use that as your figure of merit for the fit. And so you might be wondering, okay, well, this was a toy model. What really happens in like a cosmological halo? So a long time ago now, goodness, I did a test of that. Um, so these are simulated stellar streams that were made by tagging a dark, the dark matter only simulation of a Milky Way galaxy that I showed you in the beginning, the one from Aquarius. This is before fire. Um, and so this is the best we could do. But the, the galaxy that these streams evolved in was time dependent. It was, it had lumps. It's not got any prescribed symmetries. So you might wonder whether the onsatz of action space still works in this uh, kind of situation. And in fact, it does. So I painted all the streams here so you could tell which stars belong in which one. And indeed, they form slightly more complicated looking clumps, but still clumps in action space. And in fact, this the potential that we used to calculate these actions was an NFW profile fit to the halo by maximizing this clustering. And if you compare our best fit, which is in red, to the black line here, which is just the bin to dark matter distribution, you get pretty close. So the caveat is that most of the stars that we use for this test, star particles, um, are pretty far beyond what Gaia can measure. And that has a lot to do with how well the fit converges even at large distances, because basically you'll get a good fit within the range where you have data. So Gaia can get out to here. Again, we agree on that pretty well. With all these four meter spectrographs that are coming online, we'll be able to see a lot further because they'll complete the radial velocity information that Gaia doesn't determine for stars at the faint end of its uh, range. And then beyond that, we can sort of cobble together the last few things out to half the virulent radius or so um, with the other missions that I mentioned earlier. But in the meantime, here are some of our first results of applying this technique uh, to actual data that we assembled partially from Gaia and partially from other sources as we could um, for a series of known streams with known membership. Um, and so these are the rotation curves that we get when we fit the phase-based distributions of these four streams by requiring them to be the most clustered in the action space of the best fit potential. Um, so this side is kind of grayed out because uh, we're updating this plot at the moment. But if you don't, so GD1, the Grilmara Dionados stream, is somewhat of an outlier in terms of its uh, best fit velocities. And so if you throw that one out, then you get this red uh, set of constraints by using the other three. So the orphan stream, PAL5, and the Helmi stream. Um, that a little uh, with respect to other estimates down here that you see. Um, and so we're now pretty convinced that this will work not only in, in simulations, but also in the real galaxy. Here we had a lot more information than you necessarily need to have for this technique. You don't always have to know membership, but if you do, it helps you because you can then um, use the membership information as part of your uh, part of your fitting procedure. You know exactly which stars should belong in which clump, as well as how many clumps there are, um, which helps you when it comes to the, the determination of the clustering. So we're not really doing that much better yet in terms of uh, constraining the mass. You can see this result here uh, has not been completely updated. The actual curve is a little lower, um, but this was only four streams and we didn't have complete phase-based information for everything. Some of the quantities like distances and radial velocities were interpolated along the stream track from the members. Uh, what we're doing now is examining some of the biases in more detail using uh, streams from the fire simulations, which I'll talk about in a second, um, and preparing to fit the data that the H3 survey run by Charlie Conroy and Dennis Ritzke and Anna Bonazza 
um, have got in the outer halo. Um, and there, we don't necessarily know the membership of every star, uh, but we have a lot more streams in the set and should get a good constraint out to much larger distances. Another point that I want to come back to here is that, again, the, cho the choice of tracers matters not only for how far you can see them, but for how well you can measure their their phase space information. So if you look at the action space you get from giant stars where you can estimate the distance to 20%, you get a lot of blurring because the distance comes in everywhere when you're computing the actions. The distance qualities you can get from our library are much better. Um, and you also sometimes see different streams. So on this side, you see different colors for different streams in these different sample halos. Um, and the colors match over here for the same streams uh, as seen in R. Lyrae. And if you compare, sometimes you see a color in one panel, but not in the other. That means that stream has a lot of one type of stellar population, but not another. And so to get the most complete view, you actually need to combine all these tracers, which means you need fairly sophisticated stellar population modeling uh, in order to understand how to do this. And the extra information in ages or metallicities also helps you um, in this technique because it's like fuzzy membership information. So the, the stars that are created from the same thing have cor correlated integrals of motion, but also correlated ages, correlated metallicities. They're not identically correlated, but they're close enough that you can disentangle things in extra dimensions and improve your estimates that way. And that's where things like SDSS5 will really shine because they give such a large dimensionality of extra information. So we're hopeful that given the increased range of this high dimensional information about Milky Way stars in the stellar halo, we'll be able to get a better handle in not too long on the total mass. And then we can start talking about the shape of the halo, um, both its the, the slope of its mass profile as a function of radius, and also uh, whether it's axisymmetric, triaxial, how that changes with distance and so forth. Um, and in here, there's a lot of information about the impact of the crosstalk between the baryonic component of the galaxy and its dark matter, and also information about the late time interaction cross section of dark matter. And so this is something I've been digging into recently. So the first thing to know is that the shape of the dark matter halo is significantly affected in the inner part by the formation of the central galaxy um, because the tides, wakes, and torques of the dark matter on the forming disk of the galaxy and vice versa tend to average out the triaxiality that you see when you don't form a galaxy in the center of your dark matter halo. So you get something that's a lot closer to spherical in here, um, but at the outskirts still sort of remembers the directions from which things are accreting um, through the filaments connecting our galaxy to the cosmic web. So what we were wondering though is that those processes all sort of in this example presumed uh, that the dark matter is completely collisionless. That makes it difficult to lose angular momentum, uh, exchange energy, and so forth. So it limits the ability of the dark matter halo to respond to uh, the galaxy forming in the center. Um, and we were wondering, so what happens if the dark matter has a significant self-interaction cross-section. This has been posited for a number of, uh, as a solution to a number of observational discrepancies recently. Um, does this affect the halo shape? So if you use a, a model in which the dark matter does have some self-interactions uh, in the late universe, um, and you simulate a galaxy forming, you do see some differences in the, from the cold dark matter case. They're subtle, um, but this to me pointed out uh, something worth following up. So we have a, a suite of these things now. There had been reason to think that because um, a, a non-zero interaction cross-section lets the dark matter respond more efficiently, uh, to the formation of the galaxy, you would expect, uh, in particular, 
the, the inner part of the dark matter distribution would be flatter as the cross section increases, uh, because it will start to take on the, the shape of the disk distribution uh, in the galaxy. Um, and so we can check out whether this is actually the case by studying the shapes of this suite of simulations where we've run the same exact physics, uh, except for the interaction cross section of the dark matter particles. Um, and this maps back to dynamics in a couple of ways. The most interesting to me at the moment is that the orbital frequency ratios of stars in the galaxy can reveal departures from spherical symmetry. Um, so as an example from a paper from nearly 10 years ago now, um, in a spherical halo, you'll infer a lot of, um, you, you won't have very much dimensionality in the frequencies uh, of the stars. Um, but if you make the same map in a triaxial halo, uh, you'll see a lot of different resonances and structures in the, the map of the estimated frequencies for the different stellar orbits. And this is with a, a relatively uh, reasonable degree of flattening. Um, and so what I'm hoping eventually is to update some of this stuff using uh, better models that are keyed to our um, our new simulated systems in the different dark matter models. Um, it's also worth noting that modeling the uncertainties on your measurements are important since the measurements that go in here are the phase space components of the, of the star's positions and velocities, which all have uncertainties. And if you take uh, a bunch of stars for which we make these measurements with Gaia and propagate those into this frame, you can see that the resulting error bars are extremely non-trivial to deal with unless you Monte Carlo everything. So, and they can, they can, uh, to some extent, contribute to the, uh, the our ability to distinguish between potentials. So, this is an interesting idea, but in reality, we don't have an analytic growing disk in the center of the dark matter halo that stays in the same orientation all the time and has a, a well-shaped form. What we really have is a chaotically assembling galaxy. The region where we want to look for this is uh, within the region where the disk is assembling. And this is what the disk look like in the center of this dark matter halo. So it's not axisymmetric. It's definitely not static. Look at that bar there. Um, and there's lots of spiral arms and all kinds of action. You can see a little bit of a loop here. So if you compare this to the same uh, initial conditions run with the same baryonic physics, but in a, a cold dark matter halo with collisionless dark matter, you can see that there are also some differences here, but it's subtle and more complicated than we thought. So if you go through, and you map the shape of the galaxy, and by that I mean its principal uh, minor to major axis ratio of the different components as a function of radius, what you find is that all the runs, no matter which uh, simulated galaxy we're talking about or which kind of dark matter we're trying to simulate, you can create a, a galaxy with a thin gaseous disk, that's these red things, down here. These are the, the shape profiles. And so the fact that this ratio is low means that the gas distribution is very flat. Um, a, a ratio of one means a spherical system. And then there's a lot of variety in what happens in the inner part of the stellar distribution between the different runs with the same initial conditions and different dark matter physics. So each of these panels is a different suite uh, of identical con initial conditions. And you can see that in most cases, uh, what you find is that the actually the CDM only galaxy is slightly rounder, or the CDM version of the galaxy is slightly rounder in the middle than the ones with SIDM. And this suggests that there's some indeed some feedback. And when you look at the uh, dark matter, which is subject to those effects in that region, you see that it also pulls the, the dark matter distribution to be a little flatter, like you might expect. 
but there's a lot more stochastic variation, especially you can see in this case, um, there's uh, more to the story than that clearly because the, the variation is not as clean as in the, the semi-analytic models that had been done previously. So it's clear that the introduction of an interaction cross-section is um, changing the way that the dark matter responds to the baryons and vice versa, but clearly this is a two-way process. And so we're working on uh, ways to figure this out. In the meantime, I'll give you the takeaway that just measuring the axis ratios doesn't uh, go far enough to differentiate between these models, it looks like. Um, you can see here are these blue lines here on the on the right hand panel are the different runs that we did uh, with different cross sections of dark matter and the variation between them uh, is comparable to these red lines, which are the different galaxies simulated with CDM. Uh, so the variation from galaxy to galaxy uh, just by virtue of its formation history uh, gives a similar scatter and axis ratios and the shape of the dark matter halo uh, to the variation induced by fiddling with the dark matter cross section. So just measuring the cross section, or sorry, the shape alone is not enough to do it, uh, which is probably good because here's all the different attempts that I could find at measuring the shape of the Milky Way's halo and the radii that you see here. And we're not very good at this yet. So uh, it'll be useful to know where to direct our um, efforts in future. One place that we're looking now is at what happens uh, in terms of the response to a bar evolving in the center of, of a galaxy like this in different dark matter models. So even in CDM, a bar will stir up the dark matter um, just by virtue of dynamical friction. And we found that several of the simulated galaxies with different models of dark matter form a bar. And so we can look at how this responds. Um, and I have a student who's working on an analytic model uh, based on this paper by Weinberg um, to try to predict uh, what happens to the, the evolution of the bar's pattern speed if you change the dark matter and therefore the phase-based distribution of the dark matter and um, and and therefore the, the dynamical friction that it, it exerts on the bar. I'll skip that for now because I want to get to lumpiness and I know I'm probably running out of time. Okay. So the last thing I'll talk about here um, is the way in which um, the Milky Way can be used to probe the primordial dark matter temperature. And that's uh, through the degree of substructure. So, uh, the substructure in the dark matter of our galaxy has long been demonstrated to discriminate between different theories of dark matter. So uh, in a cold dark matter system, uh, you have lots of structures, although the disk is efficient at depleting them in the inner part of the uh, galaxy. Um, in warm dark matter, like I mentioned at the beginning, you cut off uh, the power spectrum of initial density perturbations at some point and damp out all the small scale structure below some cutoff. As you can see here, this halo looks a lot smoother with just large uh, lumps. Um, and in some of the models that are now popular uh, for BEC-like dark matter, stuff made of like an ultralight axion or whatever, um, some of the substructures come uh, through the same channels as CDM where you get you know, lumps of things that behave like particles, but you also get sort of interference patterns that look completely different in terms of their distribution. And so being able to discriminate between these would be really useful and tidal streams can really help us here. Um, so like I said, CDM says we should have a, a relatively lumpy halo compared to a lot of other, um, a lot of other dark matter models. And these lumps uh, will disturb the, careful ordering of stars by energy uh, that happens during tidal disruption. So this movie from Dennis Zirkal is a good uh, illustration of this. Here you see a model of a stream from a globular cluster, not a satellite galaxy. It's pretty thin, sorry. Um, and then in the bottom panel, you'll see what happens when it passes by two relatively large substructures. So it sort of reorders the particles in terms of energy. 
Um, and since this is a pretty significant interaction, eventually a little gap opens up in the stream and here's another one. Um, and so uh, these lumps should perturb the stream, uh, not always as obviously as this, but in ways that we might be able to detect since these stars all came from a relatively small part of phase space volume to begin with. So there's some really tempting uh, evidence now that we might be seeing things like this, uh, for example, in this uh, view of the GD1 stream. But there's a relatively long way to go between the observation of individual gaps or, or perturbations in uh, real tidal streams in our galaxy and an interpretation of this uh, in the context of a particular dark matter model. And the, the intervening step in doing that is to simulate the cosmological predictions for the dark matter halo along with the hierarchical assembly that cosmology predicts uh, will form the tidal streams that you're talking about. Um, so just a, a little bit of an introduction to this, the, um, if you have one of these impacts, uh, the effect after the same amount of time, which is ambiguous in most cases for real streams, uh, scales with the mass of the uh, little substructure that passed by. Um, and it's inversely proportional to the size or fluffiness of the perturber, uh, because that sort of sets how close the or how small the impact parameter can be for one of these. If you have a big subhalo, um, the the scale radius is larger, and that's really the sweet spot for disturbing the stars. Um, and the strength of one of these interactions is also inversely proportional to the relative velocity. So if something is on a slow relative speed, you'll have a larger chance to disturb the stars in the stream and reorder them. Um, and inversely proportional to the intrinsic velocity dispersion. So a cold stream will show more of an impact uh, because there's less random ordering within the stream that would over time erase this. Um, so there's actually a lot of things going on here, a lot of different handles that we can have on both the population of substructures and the types of, uh, and the population of tidal streams making up our halo. Um, unfortunately, it's not always so clean. So while this is sort of the sort of model that people like to fit, if you actually put one of these mock streams in a cosmological dark matter halo, you get something that looks more like this. Some of this is because there are too many substructures. This was a dark matter only simulated halo. Some of it might be numerical noise um, from the differences in the, in the masses of the particles. Um, but still, this is a lot more complicated system than individual substructures pa passing through because the galaxy is a very busy place. Um, and so another aspect that makes this a, a challenging study is that the disk is very efficient at depleting um, substructures in the inner part of the galaxy. Um, so this is the ratio between the number of substructures that you find when you add the galaxy into your um, cosmological simulation uh, versus the number when you ignore it and just have dark matter. For comparison, this is where the two most popular streams for doing these kinds of constraints are located. Um, they're both streams that we think are from globular clusters. In the case of PAL5, we see the cluster. Um, but they're in the region where the effect of baryonic physics is starting to be quite significant. And so really, it'd be nice if we could work out here. Um, but in order to do that, we need streams from satellite galaxies. Reassuringly, limits that people have tried to place sort of look kind of like what you would expect if this was a, a plausible model. Um, but again, because it's very hard to tell exactly how efficient the disk is at depleting substructures, like there's a pretty big spread here uh, between different galaxies, um, just by virtue of their assembly histories, it would be nice to get a little bit further away to where we think that the, that uh, effect is minimized in order to really put some strong, stronger constraints on the dark matter model. So what I've been doing is looking at whether you can use um, satellite galaxies and their tidal streams 
to do the same kinds of tests, uh, possibly in a more statistical way. Um, so what we're doing right now is just trying to get a handle on how many encounters a typical stream would experience. And that depends on both the number of subhalos and their phase based distribution and the number of tidal streams and their phase based distribution. So you have, so this big, long, horrible expression gives you sort of the number of encounters you expect as a function of uh, time and relative velocity. It depends on the age of this tidal stream and on its physical width. Um, which scales like the square root roughly of the mass of the progenitor. It depends on the scale radius, which is a function of, of the subhalos, which is a function of their mass. Um, and then on the relative velocity of these two distributions and on the number density of subhalos as a function of uh, radius within the galaxy. Um, so some of these things have to do with the phase phase distribution of the start of the tidal streams. Some have to do with the space phase distribution of subhalos and some have to do with both together. Uh, and so quantifying this, people have made different assumptions about um, each of these properties in order to simplify this expression. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to, to understand which of those assumptions are good and which are not by using the tidal streams that we've isolated from the suite of cosmological Milky Way mass galaxies that we've simulated in FIRE collaboration. So the first zeroth order thing was just to be able to tell the difference between something that's bound, something that's phase mixed, and something that's a stream. And if you look at the population of these things, um, you can see that all the blue dot or the, all the blue error bars down here, those are all the things that are still coherent at the present day. Um, the color indicates their mass in uh, in stellar mass, excuse me. Um, and the y-axis here plots the, the local velocity dispersion. So what I talk about when I talk about sigma in the previous slide is just if I pick some particles right around here in the stream, what's their velocity dispersion? So that's what's being measured here. Um, so you can see that for the coherent streams, as you would hope, uh, that local velocity dispersion is basically saturated down at the bottom of what we can uh, measure with our resolution. Um, but there's also a, a, a pretty abrupt transition between a, a period of time or a range of stream ages where you see mostly phase mixed stuff and where you see later on mostly coherent stuff. So younger streams tend to be coherent, older stuff tends to be phase mixed, that makes sense. Um, but it turns out that this transition is not so much due to the uh, mixing times, but to the point where the galaxy forming in the center makes a transition between a, a chaotic assembly phase at early times and a smoother growth of the disk um, in later times. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here that is often that is related is that the lifetimes of the coherent streams that you see in a galaxy today um, basically span the assembly history of the galaxy. Um, and so if, if you look at the orange histogram here, that's the distribution of times uh, since the different coherent streams were formed. This end over here is present day. And this end over here is the beginning of, of cosmic time. And you can see that the times that streams started to form that are still coherent at the present day range over nearly that entire period. I already talked about this. Um, the other reassuring thing is that the progenitors that we find uh, for the tidal streams in our simulations are representative of the phase space volumes that we see for uh, present day satellites observed in the Milky Way. Um, so this is a plot of velocity dispersion as a function of stellar mass. Um, in the progenitors of the stellar streams, all the colored dots, uh, and you can see that they match up with these stars to the to limit of our resolution down here. Um, so we know that when we follow the evolution of these streams in the simulation, we are actually um, starting out with a size of in phase space that is comparable to what we would expect, which is an important 
So one of the basic assumptions that we tested first uh, was whether the distribution of subhalos was isotropic. So most uh, calculations that we've that I've looked at uh, of rates of encounters assume that this is the case. That the but in our simulations we find that it's not. So the distribution of subhalos um, relative to the plane of the disk at present day is pretty is pretty uniform. Um, but present day satellite galaxies and the progenitors of present day tidal streams have orbits that prefer to be um, in the case of the tidal stream progenitors in the plane of the galaxy slightly relative to uh, a polar orbit. And present day satellite galaxies tend to be depleted uh, everywhere relative to prograde orbits uh, in the same sense as a disk. Uh, and so if you assume that this is not the case, you're going to um, or if you assume that the, the distribution of subhalos is isotropic, you're going to miss this preference. Um, and it's going to affect the rate at which you expect subhalos to be perturbing your streams. Uh, a related assumption that's often made is that the relative velocity distribution is isotropic. And we can see from the distribution of orbits of our progenitors that this isn't the case. Um, and I think this is a manifestation of the fact that the um, disk is effective at uh, depleting um, some halos preferentially on plunging orbits. And so there's a little bit of a bias towards uh, sub halos on tangential on orbits with larger tangential velocity. Um, and finally, let's go back to this uh, business about um, the galaxy being a busy place. Uh, there's been a debate lately in the community over how much of the noise that I showed you um, when simulating these tidal streams comes from uh, numerical effects as, as, in, in, as opposed to, to actual interactions with subhalos. Um, and I think that a lot more of it comes from subhalo interactions than people may want to admit. Um, so these are all these little red dots are all the subhalos that come within two kiloparsecs of this tidal stream, which is extracted from one of our cosmological simulations. Not all of these impacts are very strong, um, but there's definitely a, a, dis, a diffusive element to this process that has so far uh, been neglected in modeling. And I think it's important to, to understand that any particular interaction that, that might open a gap in this stream is going to be layered on top of by the many other interactions uh, that might be less strong uh, with subhalos as the stream evolves. Um, and in many cases, the stream has been around long enough for this to be a large number. Um, so we're in the process of tracking this sort of interactions and, and quantifying them uh, in terms of their ability to scramble the stars and, and, and cause perturbations in tidal streams um, for a suite of about 100 streams over order 15 different uh, galaxy simulations with different uh, assembly histories. And this uh, should give us some better and more realistic statistics on what to expect here. Uh, what we plan to do, these are some results from an old uh, set of simulations, is to count the number of interactions and see how they scale with the strength uh, of the interaction, which I talked about earlier. Um, and so we're working on repeating this now. So just to wind up, um, we talked about three ways in which uh, you can test dark matter um, by looking at the galaxy. But in all of these areas, um, I think it's pretty clear that we need to use test cases and, and make comparisons with realistic cosmologically uh, motivated uh, simulations of the Milky Way, which is what brought me to working with uh, the fire collaboration in the first place. Um, and so we've started to make some steps towards this. Uh, one that I didn't talk about a lot, but which you're free to ask me about, um, is to synthesize Gaia surveys of some of the, the simulations. Uh, so we chose three of the simulated systems and then put the sun at three different locations in each one of those for a total of nine catalogs. And then we simulated um, 
the complete stellar populations, and then what Gaia would measure for their positions and proper motions and, and photometry and so forth. Um, and these are available uh, for Gaia DR2 right now. We're working on an upgrade for Gaia DR3, uh, so stay tuned. And we're about to uh, release as part of the next Sloan data release, uh, a value-added catalog that includes an Apogee error model for the Gaia DR2 versions, uh, which has been put together by my grad student Farnick. Um, but the underlying uh, contents include the magnitudes and colors of all of the, the synthetic stars in each of these galaxies, just as if they were Gaia, um, plus uh, abundance information and, and phase space information, as if Gaia had observed these galaxies while living in them. So with that advertisement, I'll wind up. Thank you very much for your uh, for your attention today. I thought you're muted. Sure, I, I, I had a quick clarifying question, Robin. Yeah. Um, just about the difference between orbital frequencies and actions. So you showed um, the uh, the plots of the uh, sort of big lines and stuff in the orbital frequency space. Um, and I was just trying to uh, get an idea of how to um, uh, translate that into action space, because I think that the two are related. Yes, here, I'll, uh, I can do this real quickly. Um, so the so way that they're related is as follows. Um, here are the actions, which are computed by integrating the momentum in each conjugate coordinate across its conjugate position through one cycle of its bound orbit per star, right? Um, and then the frequencies, which come in down here, formally are the, the derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to the actions. Um, but functionally, what they are is the rate at which the angle, the conjugate angles increase linearly with time. Um, so you can think about them as literally the orbital frequencies um, of, or li literally the frequencies of oscillation of the bound orbit in the coordinate system where the potential is close to separable. So for instance, if you have a disk that's you usually assume that the coordinates are axisymmetric or close to, um, or that that's a good model for the symmetries of the potential. And then your orbital frequencies and your actions and your angles would all be couched in a sort of like cylindrical radius um, phi in the disk plane um, Z coordinate system. And so you'd have one frequency that was this frequency, one frequency that's this frequency, and one frequency that's this frequency for each star. Um, and the sort of the size of those oscillations uh, is what the actions are telling you. Does that clear things up a little bit? Yeah, I see that makes sense. Thanks. OK, can you hear me now, Robin? Yes. OK, good, it's fixed. So um, why don't I think uh, Fang Zhou has had his hand up for a while, so perhaps he can go next. Uh, sure, thanks. Uh, so uh, I wonder, so you, you made a very interesting point, uh, which is that the encounter rate of uh, uh, code streams and the substructure depend on both the phase-based distribution of uh, uh, subhalos and uh, that of, uh, uh, of the streams. So I wonder, um, do you have intuition or pr preliminary results on how would uh, ICIDM impact this encounter rate? Because on one hand, I expect ICIDM subhalos to be more prone to disruption so the, so the uh, phase space density of subhalos will be lower, but the stellar stream uh, phase space density may be higher, right? Yeah, I think you're right that this is not gonna, like that this is gonna be competing effects. Um, when, as we are classifying and following the streams in the CDM um, simulations, we're also in parallel doing the same thing for the SIDM runs. And so we'll be able to directly compare them for things that are otherwise identical, but, but for the 
the thing. But I there there have been a number of different uh, predictions that have come out that would come down on both of these sides. And I don't know which is the effect that's going to dominate, whether it's the fact that you get more tidal streams, but then like dynamical friction might work a little differently. So I'm not sure about that. And then the, the cores aren't as much less dense in simulations with baryons as they are in the simulations without baryons because the like in the case of milky way mass stuff you actually get a denser central um, dark matter density in an sidm halo because the the dark matter can respond to the deepening of the potential due to the formation right. of the galaxy better in sidm than it can in cdm right. so i don't know which way this is going to fall because there's a lot of different things that we just need to see which one is the the one that dominates or whether they all compete out um so i'll be fascinated to see what the answer to that question is but we don't have it yet <laughs> yeah me too yeah it just seems to be a very interesting area yeah yeah thanks Okay, so Josh also had a question. Yeah, so Robin, in the first session of your talk, you showed um, a nice little um, movie of how uh, if you have if you leave the shape the uh, functional form of the potential fixed and change the mass, then then it's easy to zero in on exactly what the um, what the correct mass is. And so what I was wondering is uh, how much that changes if you don't know the functional form of the potential. That's a great question, Josh. I should have paid you to ask me that one because I this is this is actually something that I've been working on um, with Stella Rhino, who's a finishing graduate student at Leiden, who is the one that did the work uh, with the the four actual streams uh, and applying this technique to those. Um, and so for her follow up, we're actually trying to dig into this issue a little bit. Um, in my initial tests with a cosmological halo, the model that we used uh, was not a very good representation of the uh, mass profile, and it came out okay. The way that you found um, in that case, the way that the, the mismatch between the model and the actual profile manifested itself was that there was a region where you could fiddle with the potential parameters a little bit, and for some combinations, some of the clumps would get tighter. And for some of the other combinations, other clumps would get tighter. And there was no way to pick the parameters so that every single clump individually was the tightest. And that was kind of a, a clue that you needed some extra flexibility in your potential. And so when we set out to do this in the, in the real galaxy, we, Stella was working with this two component Steckel model which despite what a lot of people seem to think uh, is actually a pretty decent model for the galactic potential. So one of the components ends up taking on mainly the role of the inner part of the galaxy and then the other takes on the outer part. Um, and this gives you a lot more flexibility. And in fact, when we, we first tried it with a single seckle, which you know has gotta be a bad approximation because you're completely ignoring the fact that the halo is mo mostly round and the disc is mostly flat. Um, and you see a lot of this discrepancy between individual clumps uh, in that case, like to the point where they gave completely um, conflicting individual estimates of the mass of, of the parameters. And then when we introduced the flexibility of a second component, uh, which is like loosening up the functional form, uh, then you got much more agreement between the results from the individual streams. And when you combine them, you got something that made sense. Um, so you, you see your systematic like, I don't know if systematics is the right way to put that, but um, so now what we're doing is we're trying the same thing out on some of the simulated streams in our galaxies to, and then playing also what we found is just as important seems to be the orbital phase of the stars of each stream that you include in your sample. So if you were just for some reason, like, you know, say you live in the center of the galaxy to only get mostly stars and streams that are near pericenter, you actually get a pretty terrible mass estimate um, because they're relatively insensitive to what's happening at large distances. And you have a lot of room to roam with your apicenter distances if you don't ever measure stars at apicenter. Um, and so we've been playing with this a little bit um, to see whether you can beat that down just by piling on more streams or do you actually need to be sensitive to what orbital phase everything is in and so forth. Um, but I think uh, that's, 
that's sort of the the status that we've uh, to which we've explored various um, sources of systematic error in this um, in this thing. The other thing that we're, we've been working on, incidentally, in the group that I didn't even talk about, um, is I have a student who's been studying how to build um, completely agnostic models by using low order of multiple basis function expansions um, to represent the potential of the halo um, and then just treat the disk as we know it is because we've pretty much modeled the mass distribution of the disk stars uh, fairly well. Um, and that that also seems to be a little more robust to um, the types of perturbations that people are pointing out uh, from uh, mergers like the LMC and SM or, uh, Sagittarius, where you expect some sort of wake from the dark matter disturbances associated with the merger. It can absorb a little bit of that stuff if you give the potential model a little more flexibility. Um, that's not necessarily a new conclusion, but it's one that I think people are starting to realize that we need to know more and more given the, the direction things are going. Okay, thanks. Perhaps Ting can ask her question very quickly and then, I'm sorry, Alex, I think we should end after that. So I have two questions actually, but you feel free which one you want to answer because I think both are interesting to me. The first is related to the first part of the, uh, the your talk. So I understand you are using the the the, uh, act, uh, the clustering in action space to constrain the Milky Way mass, but we also know that the Milky Way has like uh, satellite galaxies like uh, the LMC, which kind of perturb a lot of the streams. Yeah. So I guess my question is. Um, uh, so what do you you, you think the, the way to properly deal with this is like just to deal with the stream that we know has no significant perturbation from the LMC and use those to constrain the mass? Or if you can also can include an LMC model like in the whole kind of uh, fitting like and doing like a fitting with LMC and, and the Milky Way mass and shape uh, simultaneously. And the second question is, so the, th the third part of the talk, you're talking about like substructures using dwarf galaxy streams. But my understanding like Sagittarius stream, like we, we always talk about saying, constrain the subhalos using code streams, mostly from global cluster, because um, like if the stream is dynamically too hot, like a Sagittarius stream has like 10 to 15 kilo kilometers per second, then those stream basically, the, the gaps it formed will get just uh, fill back after a few million years. So I don't know like if this is a thing problem for you and you have some certain kind of constraint, but what is the minimal, or sorry, what is the maximal velocity dispersion for the stream will be useful for the study you are talking about here. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna tackle the second one and we can talk because the, the first one is a, a shorter answer and I'll get back to it. So the, I think you're right that the Sagittarius stream is probably not the best one to use if you're trying to do this uh, with satellite streams, but there's a long way to go between that and like a globular cluster. And some of the thinner streams uh, from lower mass satellites uh, are probably good candidates for this. There are two other aspects of this that I think have been neglected that we're trying to assess right now in the cosmological simulations. One is the fact that things like Sagittarius usually are part of a group infall. And they bring in a set of uh, their own substructures on orbits that make it possible that you could have repeated low velocity interactions with the stream over time. And that may amplify the signal for larger streams like that. And I'm not sure how, to what extent that's the case, uh, but I, I think it's an interesting thing that we're trying to follow up is to see whether this kind of repeat encounter happens more frequently for stuff that is in a more massive stream. Because it might be, helpful in uh, adding those to the population because otherwise I, you're right the the velocity dispersion is too big to really open up a gap the other part of that that we're hoping to to constrain is to get a better idea of the encounter rate of even weak encounters and then be able to sort of better estimate the floor in the velocity dispersion that you would expect given that encounter rate because the, the low mass interaction or the like less strong interactions won't necessarily do anything to the, the structure of the stream and density, but they will, they're gonna be competing 
against so that kind of like diffusive heating is com competing against the what I would call gravitational cooling, just like Louisville's theorem, the thing is spreading out and getting colder over time. And it's not obvious to me that there, there have only been a few attempts to make that calculation and they've all been with uh, models that didn't account for things like the baryonic depletion of subhalos uh, and, and all the like anisotropies that we're finding. So what I'm hoping to do is update those estimates and see which of those processes actually wins um, in, a, in a realistic case. We'll see. Um, so your first question though is about um, LMC. the LMC and, and taking that into account with models. Um, we're just starting to look into this. I think if you don't want to add an LMC to your model, you'll probably have to use um, a more flexible model like the basis expansions that we're trying out right now. Those seem to do better with, with the presence of an LMC nearby. Um, you can push them further with the actions-based modeling approach. What's interesting is that it doesn't really spread out the clumps so much as it like moves them around to have once you have that kind of model. So you, you still maintain some of the features of action space, even though they're approximate actions. Um, if you if you have like a couple orders of of your basis expansion, even if you constrain it to be axisymmetric, can still sort of put some mass where it thinks the LMC should be, even though you haven't explicitly included it in your model, and that helps get something that makes more sense to the to the method. Um, so that's that's kind of the direction that I think we're probably going to go with that. Um, but it's that's still work in progress. We've been looking at how coherent action space remains if you fail to model something like the LMC interaction um, and what that actually means for, for that sort of thing. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, we've had a lot of time for questions. So thanks to everyone who stuck around. Um, and of course, thanks to Robin for your detailed responses and your excellent colloquium. Um, pleasure. So yeah, and this will also give you a little time to decompress before your next meeting. Okay. So thanks again, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. One was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks.